yeah, I suppose that's uh, it. Uh, welcome. My name is Fleming Rose. On behalf of the Ayan Hirschi Ali Foundation, I want to welcome you to the third in a series of Ayan Hirschi Ali Dialogues. Today, I will be your host, and the topic of our, our dialogue will be the unraveling cancel culture. What is it? How has it played out on the left and on the right? And why did it spread from campus to society at large? And how serious a challenge is it? Let me start by introducing our two speakers. Ayan Hirschi Ali is the founder of the AHA Foundation, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, an author and a profound and important voice in the public debate about women's rights as part of the struggle for individual rights. Welcome, Ayan. Thank you. Uh, Greg Lukyanov is the president and CEO of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, uh, NGO that was founded in 1999 to fight for academic freedom and free speech within academia on campuses. Greg is also a First Amendment lawyer and FIRE has now decided to go beyond the academic world and defend free speech across uh, society in the US. And therefore it's not about education, but expression in general. Greg is the author and co-author of several books, among them, the New York Times bestseller, The Coddling of the American Mind, which he co-authored with Jonathan Haidt. Greg's forthcoming book, The Canceling of the American Mind is co-authored with Ricky Schlott. And it is this book that will be the center of today's dialogue. Um, people in the audience are welcome to forward questions in the chat section, and then we'll see if there will be time to answer them towards the end of uh, our conversation. So first, Ayan, I'll kindly ask you to say a few words about cancel culture. Is it a problem? And if yes, why? Um, uh, our conversation. So first, Ayan, I'll kindly ask you to say a few words about cancel culture. Is it a problem? And if yes, why? Um, cancel culture is a modern way of saying censorship. Um, because it's censorship um, that's not directed by the government, it's very difficult to label it censorship in the way that we classically understand it. Um, it is, um, you know, mob justice in a way because it's not institutions that are counseling people, but it's individuals who organize themselves within institutions, within universities, within uh, even parts of the government. Um, within uh, various education systems, within corporations, and those individuals then set out to censor other people. And uh, in my experience, if I look at, I've spoken to many students of uh, many universities, and I've come to the conclusion that a majority of students and even a majority of faculty uh, do not want this censorship. They don't want these cancellations. They do not support the ideology of this very loud minority, but they are terrified enough of them to self-censor. So in that sense, yes, it's a very, very big problem. And I know Greg is going to speak to it, but it is truly a closing of um, the American mind, of the young mind. And because this virus has spread to other parts of the world, uh, in Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, even as far out as uh, other non-Western continents, um, all um, bad forces who seek to um, impose their will on others through censorship are uniting around this idea that uh, cancelling people, shaming them into silence uh, is the way forward. Mm -hmm. You 
mentioned, in fact, Alan Bloom's book from 1987, I guess, which is also quoted in Greg's book, uh, Closing of the American Mind. And of course, canceling the American mind is also an illusion, but it's also a reference to uh, Greg's um, former book that I mentioned in the introduction. And Greg, before I let you answer the same question, I want to ask you if uh, if if you are and Ricky Slot's uh, forthcoming book is a sequel to the coddling of the American wind. Are the two books in any way related? And if yes, how? They they are actually quite closely related. Um, Jonathan Haidt does the foreword to it. Um, I actually let him set up uh, a lot of the ground we covered in coddling. And so we could refer back to uh, some of our ideas in coddling the American mind included what we call the three great untruths um, that essentially th these are bad pieces of advice that contradict ancient wisdom and modern psychological thought that if you believe them, you'll be miserable. <laughs> and we uh, just, just, just remind us uh, of the of the three great. Uh, oh, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I was going to yeah. plan it to um, what what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Um, always trust your feelings. And life is a battle between good people and evil people. Um, and all of these are wild oversimplifications and things that will not make you happy if you believe them. In this book, we actually uh, we add one more, which is no bad person has any good opinion. Um, that essentially, when you look at the primitive way we debate, and social media has surely made all of this worse, worse um, but also this happens on campus, a lot of what people really are arguing is, I can show you're a bad person, and therefore, we don't have to listen to you anymore. And sometimes, you know, you, one, one thing that is assumed, particularly on the left, is that if I can argue that you're a conservative, that means you're a bad person, and therefore, I don't need to listen to you uh, a, a, anymore. Mm -hmm. So it, it does borrow a lot from coddling the American mind, and we do come back to coddling uh, quite a bit. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is both the trends that I saw uh, coming in, in, in 2014 relating to mental health, social media, and academic freedom and free speech. Um, that's exactly the same time cancel culture really started to kick up into high gear as well. Mm -hmm. And there is an ongoing debate about how serious a problem cancel culture is. Um, is it being exaggerated or the opposite? And everybody could probably find examples supporting their own point of view. And Greg, I take it that you think this is a serious problem. Otherwise, you wouldn't have written a whole book about it and exposed yourself to the kind of criticism that probably will follow after its publication. Can can you explain why you think this is a serious problem and address some of the counter arguments that you, of course, know very well? Sure, abs absolutely. But first, I want to give my definition of cancel culture. Um, and it's and what I'm trying to do, what me and Ricky are trying to do, is make an argument for this being the term for the particular historical era we're in, just the same way we refer to the Red Scare or McCarthyism with a term that indicates it was a mass censorship event, um, a term that I avoid using in the book, but I use in my real life, um, uh, to try to think of it as, as, as a historical era. So we talk about the uptick since 2014 of campaigns to get people fired, expelled, deplatformed, or otherwise punished for speech that would uh, be protected by the First Amendment, say, like in the context of a public employee, and the culture of fear that has uh, fear and conformity that has resulted from these happening. And I have to say, I it's hard for me to, I can't really pretend to take the arguments against um, cancel culture existing all that seriously, because they largely rely on not knowing a lot about the topic. Um, I, there was one person who really should have known better, um, who finding out, in, you know, the hundreds of professors who have lost their jobs or have been, uh, and, the, or, and have been targeted for their speech, you're like, oh, that's a problem that's essentially solved. That's got to be, you know, right around the, you know, that that's normal, right? It's like, no, that shows tremendous historical ignorance to say that that's normal. Um, we we actually do did a big historical survey of academic freedom and freedom of speech. Uh, you, you know, I give the example of 9/11. The last time we had a major uh, national security crisis, usually um, mass censorship events go with national security crises, and there was about 15, 17 professors targeted. Uh, three were fired, um, but all three of those, the, the schools actually had better rationales than, than their freedom of speech. One was Ward Churchill, where the argument was um, that that was 
uh, th that he engaged in academic misconduct, which he did. Um, so, uh, so they got him on something real. Another one had was shown to actually have ties to terrorism. And obviously, you can fire fire someone for that. And the other one, um, the, the the final one, which was more about the Iraq War, really was a professor taking a substantial chunk of their class that was on technical writing to go to, to go on a long political rant. And it's like, well, you know, even under the law, like if you don't teach your class, you can still be punished. So but, but three professors, you know, being fired is still considered kind of a big deal historically. Um, our numbers that we show in, in canceling of the American mind are about over a thousand professors targeted. Um, uh, about two thirds of those uh, had, were punished in some way since 2014. With uh, at this point, actually, I just re, re up the data over 200 of them fired. Um, and many of those professors, tenured professors, which used to be when I started my career, that was impossible. So there's no period that you can compare the modern period to since the law was established between 1957 and 1973, wh where it's been this bad. I even make the point that, you know, we looked at the uh, McCarthyism. We, we looked at the numbers there. Uh, there was a massive study being conducted at the time, like towards the end of McCarthyism, that found about 63 professors were fired uh, for being communists, about 90 for their opinion overall. And that's usually rounded up to 100. Um, so people who say that this isn't, council culture isn't happening or, or minimize it, that it's not that significant. You want to ask, it's like, okay, do you think, the Red Scare, McCarthyism was was a big deal because if you do, we're talking about depending on how you slice it, between you know three times as many or twice as many professors getting fired. Um, that's got, that's got to count for something. And by the way, we know that number's a wild undercount too, because sixteen percent, one in six professors said that they've been either threatened with punishment um, for what they said on campus, uh, for, for what they what they said re, with their research or their pedagogy, things protected by academic freedom and free speech. One in six, one third of them responded that they've been told by uh, administrators or, or fellow faculty to avoid controversial topics. And there was a survey conducted during the Red Scare that only about 9% of professors said that they were self-censoring. And that's bad. Like that's one in 10, by the way. Uh, so 9% is a bad number. Um, even though the questions weren't identical, when you ask professors today, partially because it includes things like social media, et cetera, that just didn't exist back then, but about 90% say they're self-censoring in at least one of those fields, whether it's their research or in class or in, in, in their daily lives. So it, it, I, like I said, I have a hard time taking seriously people who claim that cancel culture isn't real. I feel like they have an ideological chip on their shoulder and it, the evidence you know, is overwhelming and we present it in the book. Mm -hmm. Ion, you want to? I'd like to. Uh, yeah, actually, and, I uh, find this very interesting. So, I want to ask Greg if there's anything we know then about the impact of this on the quality of the education, on the quality of the curriculum, if professors are either fired and silenced, or so many of them are, in fact, I know many of them are terrified of being silenced. What is the impact of that on research, on innovation, on you know, what the university is all about, which is to teach kids how to think, not what to think. Yeah. Um, well, in our polling that we do at FIRE, uh, it definitely is clear that professors are scared of their own students. Um, students are more, they're scared of their professors, but they're more scared of each other, uh, which is, and that comes out in multiple polls, that they're afraid of getting canceled by their peers. Um, what it does uh, to the larger trust and expertise is a major theme of the book. And we talk about uh, one of the things we try to do that's different from a lot of other books is, is we try to layer what we call the conformity inducing pressures on top of them and show like how if you're going to go to, God forbid, go to an elite college, the conformity, uh, you know, inducing pressures start in K through 12, maybe even start in kindergarten. And then we talk about, for example, diversity, equity and inclusion statements, which any sensible person has to understand that that's a political litmus test that's asking you like are your politics appropriate and these exist now at every stage from k through 12 on up through graduate school uh through job applications when you're a professor and uh we also add that, that then it, the kicker so we have this chapter called the conformity gauntlet where we show all the different conformity inducing pressures you'd have to survive if say you wanted to be a famous professor at the end of the day. And then just to at the very end of it, we're saying, and by the way, also um, Nature, Human Behavior and a number of other magazines are really clearly indicating 
that uh, and they said it pretty publicly that they will not um, uh, they will consider not publishing research that shows any likelihood of harm to groups or uh, to groups, which basically means like you could have gotten through all of this stuff and that would still be pretty tough without being canceled or or, or still wanting to be a professor for some for some reason, and you still won't even be published if you find something if your research indicates something that might not be a very you know popular finding, and one of the big things that we stress in the book uh, is that. Cancel culture destroys trust and expertise, and and because the public isn't stupid. When when they see cases like Carol Hoovens, for example, at Harvard, um, who went on Fox News to talk about her her then new book in 2022, Testosterone, which is a brilliant, compassionate, lovely book, talking about she's an evolutionary biologist, and she makes the point that you should treat trans people with dignity, you should use their pronouns, all of this. this stuff to show respect to them, but we have to accept that biological sex is real and it's important. And she she tried to be as compassionate in the way she explained this as possible, but still actually be a scientist. And there was immediately, as happens time and time again, a push by a DEI administrator, you know, calls us an outrage, you know, uh, students organize petitions against her. And eventually, you know, she decides to leave Harvard because it, uh, she got really, frankly, depressed, um, as we talk about in an interview um, in the book. Now, what did, but what does that do to outsiders looking, you know, looking for who's going to be object? Like now I'm su- like basically now I'm suddenly hearing that maybe biological sex isn't real. Who can I trust to give me an objective opinion? And they look at higher ed. They're like, well, I can't trust any of you because you wouldn't even tell me if you found anything to, to the contrary. Because look, there are people who are getting their careers ruined if they say slightly the wrong thing about it. So I think that cancel culture is devastating, not just to research and to teaching, but to trust in in, in research and teaching. And expertise, yeah. 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 I just want to uh, thank the um, viewers and listeners that are coming in. A lot of uh, great questions, and I hope we can uh, return to them at some point. Um, I just want to um, follow up on what you said, Greg, about McCarthyism, because I think you know most people would agree that McCarthyism was a bad thing. But 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 when we talk about cancel culture, I mean that's a pejorative uh, term i think a lot of people would say well this is just about accountability yes uh, this is in fact a good thing um so so uh, i mean is there a difference here um between the way academia or progressives uh, um, perceived mccarthyism back then and then this phenomena uh, today yeah, I mean, there's lots of differences. And I have a sub stack now uh, called The Eternally Radical Idea, where I write about free speech and some of the themes in cancel culture. And I'm going to be giving sort of a historical overview of previous mass censorship events, um, you know, th- uh, throughout throughout American history. And one of the biggest differences is that uh, during McCarthyism, there was actually was a national security crisis. Um, I, I mean, if, if it, it people knew that American and, and British uh, citizens were helping someone as monstrous as Stalin get both the atom bomb faster than he would have and the, and the hydrogen bomb faster than they would have. I always I always challenge people, if you were around back then, you would have freaked out too. Um, and so there was a, there was a there was a very real sense of threat. We don't have that today. Um, also during McCarthyism, um, uh, in, uh, prior to 57, the law was even clear. Basically, the rationale that a lot of schools used for firing communists was saying, these people are so doctrinaire, they can't be trusted to actually be objective teachers. That, that was the argument. And, and you know, uh, that's an argument that we would fight against at fire. But but uh, but they wasn't even clear that you couldn't fire professors. Uh, but, but before 1957, for that reason, today, there is no giant national security crisis. I mean, like since 2014, I mean, we're not in a time of war, which is usually when mass censorship events uh, take place, of course, up until, you know, it, 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 Notwithstanding what's going on in Ukraine and Israel, the U.S. is not currently uh, at war. Um, And so it makes it a historically weird moment. Now, the accountability culture thing is just question begging. It it basically means it indicates to me. And uh, again, I, I, I have a hard time taking it too seriously that you don't know a lot about the topic, because if you knew a lot of the cancellations that took place with professors, there's literally, because we also point out, to be clear, this is a nonpartisan book. We point out when cancel culture happens on the right and the left as well. 
And there's no way you could agree with all the examples we have in the book and think that they're just someone being held accountable. So it indicates you don't know a lot about the topic. You don't want to learn a lot about the topic. And it gets treated as if it's a real argument when all you're really saying is that I'm just assuming that everyone has it coming. Now, of course, there's also the argument they like to add on to this. It's just the weaker people, you know, uh, ju just the disadvantage rising up, which I have also have a hard time not kind of rolling my eyes at. Because cancel culture is, and this is in all the evidence we see, disproportionately a problem of elite higher education. It's not that it doesn't exist in the rest of higher education, but it's much, much, much worse in elite higher education um, th than it is uh, at, at anywhere else. And these are overwhelmingly, you know, I, I think there was a great stat that was talking about places like Stanford, for example, Harvard, et cetera, educate more people from the top 1% than they, they educate from the bottom 50 or 60%. These, these are rich institutions. And a lot of times these are very wealthy, you know, uh, students, oftentimes in conjunction with um, administrators kind of cheering them along that are going after professors because they don't like, you know, what they said or going after their fe fellow uh, classmates. So it's not it, it's it's the privilege rising or rising up against the privilege more often than not. Mm -hmm. Speaking about uh, national uh, security, um, I think it's difficult to conduct a webinar uh, on free speech and um, connected to democracy uh, without uh, mentioning what is happening right now in of course. the uh, uh, Middle East. And in fact, one of the reasons why we need free speech is in order to solve our disagreements with words and arguments and not through violence uh, and destruction. And in fact, there is a question here that I want to pass on to you. Um, it's uh, Nilofar Rachman who asks, campus-wide support of Hamas terrorists seen in many big cities, is it free speech? Mm -hmm. Should it be censored or how to tackle this kind of, and then he labels it anti-Semitism, which might not necessarily be the case, but that's the way he uh, phrases it. Yeah. Uh, I, we'll, we'll, uh, you, you can go first, uh, Greg, and then I on. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to, here's my idiosyncratic theory on freedom of speech, and I call it the pure informational theory of freedom of speech, um, which is you can't understand the world unless you know what people really think. And that means that um, you shouldn't, uh, that knowing that people have monstrous, primitive, stupid ideas, is it's not, uh, it's not even if they have those ideas that it's valuable to know. It's especially important um, if they have kind of ideas that we might find repugnant. It's very important for the public to actually know that. Um, so I think that all you'd achieve if we tried to censor these opinions coming out of higher ed would be just indicating that we don't, we want to put our fingers in their ears to what these people really think. It's better to know in, uh, in general what people really think. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting is I'm a supporter of the Calvin Report, which means that uh, institutions have made a mistake making too many political positions um, uh, on various topics because they create an orthodoxy. They basically indicate like this is a pro anything from pro affirmative action to pro Ukraine war to even stuff I very much agree with. But nonetheless, they're sending a message. This is the orthodoxy at our school. And that's a, and that's a major problem. Uh, but I thought Larry Summers and Sam Abrams, uh, Larry Summers at Harvard, Sam Abrams at, at um, Sarah Lawrence College, were absolutely right when they said, hey, you've commented on every other uh, minor thing that's happened in the world. And there seems to be great hesitance to call out, you know, murder, rape and kidnapping that's actually happening in, in, in the early parts of the war. So they can absolutely be called out for the uh, for the hypocrisy there. Um, so, yeah, I, some of the stuff that we see so far, and this is something that might surprise some people, my career started at, right on 9-11. Like I landed in Philadelphia for my new job at FIRE on, at 9, 10 a.m. on 9-11. But what people don't appreciate is because suddenly academia had this sense of their ox being gored, that, that some of the reflexively pro-terrorist speech, which really did happen on campus, was suddenly, you know, um, held up to a public glare that they suddenly briefly, at least for a couple of years, actually, improved their appreciation of academic freedom and free speech and their rhetoric around it. Um, cynically, I think this is going to lead some campuses when they realize, oh, wait, I can get in trouble too, to, to suddenly start speaking from the hymnal of academic freedom and free speech again. 
Um, and, you know, I'll I'll take it and I will hold them to that the, the, the next time someone they don't like gets in trouble. Mm -hmm. Ayan, is there a connection between what is happening in the Middle East and what we are talking about here? Cancel culture, freedom of expression? Absolutely. Um, let me start by saying I agree with Greg on everything he said. I wholeheartedly agree with the fact that people should be allowed to give their views even when they are repugnant, repugnant and that, that is really quite important. If uh, we believed in censorship, we wouldn't be seeing large numbers of students on American university campuses supporting slaughter, supporting a depraved and perverse way of dealing with fellow human beings and seeing babies being beheaded and grandmothers being tortured and killed. And then our fellow students, you know, I'm at Stanford. There are students on my campus who are holding bed sheets up saying, liberate Palestine by all means possible. So it's good for me and my colleagues, my fellow students to know who is among us. That is the power of free speech. You want to know what people think, even when what they think is really terrible. Um, why do they think that? That is, I think, the second part of that relates to your question, which is because, a, as Greg uh, described, um, our universities have been politicized. Uh, I went to the University of Leiden. This was between 1995 and 2000. Leiden is in the Netherlands. I had no clue what the political affinities of my professors were. It wasn't done. And the way we were taught, the study, um, any kind of you know essay or course or whatever you took was separated into facts first. Let's all agree on the facts. And then after we've all taken note of the facts, then we're going to start forming opinions and then discussing and engaging with each other's views, the views of the various authors. That's how it was conducted. And I'm forever grateful to those professors because the whole exercise was to learn how to think. And what we are seeing with the students right now, who are not all students, but this minority of students who are demonstrating for slaughter, that's basically what it is. Um, I think uh, they have been done an injustice. Um, they've been tribalized. They've only learned that they can think or rather support the tribe or the club or the faction or the caste that they support and that they should silence the other. That is what university education has provided them with. And if they came with these ideas and these notions, if they came with this zealotry, this fanaticism, then the university has done them no good because the university hasn't helped them relinquish that. The university hasn't given them, taught them how to think through very complex moral questions. What I don't think is a, a complex moral question is slaughtering babies and grandmothers. I don't think that's that's complex. But I don't want us to confuse, you know, free speech as a principle, as a matter of principle, is everybody has the right to think and to express those thoughts and those views peacefully. And everyone else has the right to look at that, to judge it, and to give feedback. Oh. And that's a modern way of saying to respond to that. It's basically only that exercise of freely exchanging what we think. That is what the First Amendment protects. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg, you want to add? Uh, yeah, anything? no, I, I, absolutely. I do think cancel culture is one of the ways you ended up with such a monolithic opinion um, on campus, something that was so, you know, to, to be critical of it, so uncritical, something that was so reflexive. Um, and it's in part because, and, and FIRE has a long and proud history of defending people on it either side of like the uh, Israel-Palestine, and we always will. We're a genuinely nonpartisan organization. But I have seen a lot of cases where if someone says, particularly in elite higher education, says something you know supportive of Israel, like that can be an extremely controversial thing to say on campus. But once you scare those people into either shutting up or conforming, you create this um, kind of you know preference falsification, to quote Timur Koran, kind of uh, atmosphere, where I think a lot of students genuinely uncritically thought that anything that Hamas does to you know fight back against Israel is okay a, a way of thinking about it that's only 
uh, possible in an environment where people are too scared to disagree with you. Um, so, so I think that that it, it's a sign of how group thinking elite higher education has gotten. And when I and when I think about, and of course, you know, if professors get fired for having uh, uh, opinions on this, um, wherever it is on the spectrum, we, we will proudly defend them. But if this results in people thinking twice about hiring so much of, and forgive the Marxist expression, but you know, I think it's true, so much of the American ruling class um, from elite higher education, uh, I would be very, very pleased because that's one of the things we do talk about. I think uh, uh, elite higher education distorts America in profound ways that go well beyond people who ever would attend, you know, the, the, what I call the fancies, the fancy schools. Um, and I think that it, it actually distorts so much about American. Like, I, I think that if uh, Goldman Sachs and all these other countries, uh, co companies decided, you know what, we're going to favor kids from some of these big state schools or better yet, University of Austin at Texas, you know, um, it would lead to a healthier country. Yeah, we have to set up the University of Austin, Texas first. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, and I really think that it is possible now to go down the path of looking for alternatives because these universities, are, like these universities are failing, just like, by the way, our media has failed and is failing. But I think there's another point to be made here. Um, and this is, it's a really small group of people who are counseling other people. A majority, I probably even like in the 90s, maybe even 99% of students and faculty don't really agree with this. And so here we're looking at a different crisis and I don't know what to call it. For, for the moment, I'm just calling it, it's a crisis of courage within the, within the majority that we are just terrified. We are scared of a small group of people who are determined to disrupt classes, who are determined to moralize, not just about what's going on now, but to moralize about the past. So books that uh, they should be reading, we should all be reading, but then who happen to have been written in a different era. Um, and, you know, when there were different norms, this comes again to engaging with difficult moral um, frameworks. Um, those books have all got to be taken off the shelves. They can't be taught. The majority knows that that is wrong because you're clean slating, you're throwing away history. If you throw away history, if you don't know your history, then you can't learn from it, you're going to repeat it. So we have a small fraction of the university population who would like us to repeat all the bad things that human beings did in the past, and the rest of us are standing, watching, and letting that happen, and letting them get away with it, and censoring and self-censoring and applying. We're applying the most soothing techniques to ourselves and saying, look, they're going to grow out of it. They're going to hit the wall. Everything is going to be fine. Everything is not going to be fine. Look at how they're responding to an issue of naked evil versus good. Right? What is unfolding um, in the Middle East right now? There was a rave. There were kids under 30 who were dancing. It's like Burning Man in, you know, in the desert here in California and uh, like Glastonbury in the UK. These are kids who are having fun to go and barge in there and kill them because of a political opinion. And we can't condemn that when the majority of us think that that should be condemned because there's a small minority who's holding us hostage. I really don't think that that's, yeah, go on, Greg. I, at the risk of depressing, I am a little more. Um, so one thing that FIRE does that I'm very proud of, well, actually, everything we do, I'm proud of, but we have a research department that actually does this very rigorous um, uh, free speech ranking for schools. And while I've been bashing, you know, elite higher ed, I should point out UVA does very well and it finished in the top 10. University of Chicago always does very well. Those those tend to be the exceptions for elite schools that actually do great. Uh, Purdue, of course, does, does well as well. Harvard uh, earned its dead last place this year, um, absolutely, uh, followed by University of Pennsylvania, Georgetown, and interestingly, University of South Carolina. Um, so we, we pull this. One thing that makes me worried that maybe the numbers aren't that small is we ask about acceptability of shoutdowns, acceptability of um, blocking people from getting into speeches, and even just flat out, 
acceptability mm -hmm. of violence? Um, and the answer, the correct answer, as far as I'm concerned, of course, is that those are never appropriate. I don't like I don't care if the, a monster shows up to your campus. If you're thinking like scholars, you should be thinking, I want to know why this person thinks what they think. You know, you should be thinking like scholars. And I think it was only about half of students at Oberlin said violence was never OK in response to speech. And when it comes to the shoutdowns, when it comes to the um, when it comes to the blocking people, those are, are are much more popular among elite college graduates. And it's it's very troubling, you know, for the future of our country if people actually think this way. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how do you explain that, uh, Greg, that people sincerely believe that violence is oh, legitimate, uh, you know, um, if you want to counter uh, ideas or people you dislike. So in, in Canceling of the American Mind, we talk about the free speech movement on campus beginning in 1964 um, in uh, at Berkeley and the anti-free speech movement beginning, beginning with Herbert Marcuse. I think it was Santa Barbara maybe at that time, but beginning in 1965. And because a lot of times like people like me and Height and, you know, we try to be good and thoughtful. So, so we don't want to blame people. We tend to t talk about impersonal sort of social factors making things worse. And definitely some of those factors, like the the, the homogenization of political opinion and higher ed makes that tribalism much more likely. But there was some very intentional actors in this as well who really wanted to quite explicitly. And I mean, Herbert Marcuse, I, when I went back and reread um, the repressive tolerance from 1965, it's very clear. Uh, good liberals, good progressives, good communists, you know, should get freedom of speech. Uh, so-called right-wingers, so-called conservatives should not. Um, th they should be censored in the name of tolerance. And of course, like uh, all, all of the use of freedom and all, all of the terms that they use is just completely backwards. Like, And they know it. So they're, they're using dishonest de definitions of this. But that was added to people like um, R Richard Delgado, the Mary Matsuda, the founders of critical race theory. Um, uh, one thing that they did early on, one of the first things they did was advocate for campus speech codes. So there's been a very intentional effort, at least in some parts of the academy, to get people to turn on freedom of speech. And this was absolutely happening when I was at the when I was at Stanford in the late 90s, when I was at the ACLU in 1999, there was an intentional um, idea that the left needs to turn against free speech, because when we're in power, we want to be able to, you know, uh, uh, repress the, the intolerant, so, uh, so to speak. So I think this has been a long time coming. It's very much helped along by an administrative class and departments that actually think a big part of their job is to police freedom of speech. It's very much helped along by departments that in some cases have literally no conservatives uh, because then you get the, all the group uh, think taking place. But it's also part of a very intentional effort uh, among s some departments that has unfortunately caught on a lot of steam. And it's been like, helped, of course, by corporations that have set up human resources departments that are all about censorship. And it's helped along by technology. Um, and tech bosses. <laughs> I think I'm being censored here. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, I, there are so many factors that have. Oh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> hi, I'm Greg. Uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's nice. Um, you know, uh, uh, following up on what Ayan just uh, said, that's great. Um, uh, great to you because. There was a time when people said, uh, well, cancel culture or its predecessors are confined to college campuses. Uh, it will stay within campuses because it's incompatible with the challenges people face in the real world. I remember that discussion 10, 15 years ago, yep. uh, uh, but it turned out to be wrong. Yep. What and, and, we, and we saw this coming go, going way back that if that if a, if you reach a critical mass of people, particularly who would go when you disproportionately rely on elite colleges to uh, to, 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 you know, man, <laughs> a lot of these corporations, a lot of these influential institutions, if all of them are taught from a pretty early age that free speech is part of the problem, that's eventually going to break out off of campus and, and end up everywhere. And the turning point that we see, which I mentioned already, was. Uh, when Gen Z started hitting campus around 2014, a lot of these cancel culture habits came. This is one of the great things, by the way, of writing. My co-author is this absolutely brilliant 
23 year old named Ricky Schlott. Um, and she, and she found it interesting that I was talking about cancel culture really taking off in 2014. And she's like, well, that's kind of news to me because I grew up with it. I'm like, exactly. But here's why, why, why these two things are not in, incompatible with each other. You grew up with it, but it wasn't all that relevant until uh, to the rest of the country when it started hitting campuses. And it, unfortunately you can follow the progression of Gen Z you know, hitting uh, hitting campus around 20, uh, late 2013, 2014. And then you can start seeing it hit in corporations. Guess what? 2017, 2018, as they're graduating and going to the real world. And this was all predictable. Um, the fact that so many corporations, though, felt like they couldn't fight back against it and that they actually had to, you know, uh, they had to agree, you know, you know with the uh, w- with people who had no tolerance for people who disagreed with their politics showing up on campus was particularly glaring in 2020 and 2021, which I think all, well, even though we saw this coming, it was much worse than either me or Height or anyone at Fire uh, thought it was going to be so fast. Mm-hmm. Could you could you please say a little bit uh, because there is a question here um, indicating that we are focusing uh, more on. Uh, canceling by the left yeah uh, uh, but in fact in your book you have uh, a whole chapter and maybe even we well, have three chapters actually also, on, on, on... also dealing with uh, what is going on on the right oh absolutely could, could, you, could you lay that out uh, greg please yeah absolutely so we talk about um cancel culture on the right as well uh, uh, we talk about uh book challenges and even though so- some of those cases are cases where someone's saying that book isn't appropriate for a 12 year old which is um you know something that like libraries always consider there are actually situations where people are sending you know police to arrest librarians and uh, or when a book uh, that might otherwise be characterized as inappropriate for uh, for a kid is actually entirely taken out of the library instead of just moved to the adult section that we consider actual book ban so we, we have a chapter on that we talk about some of the bad legislation that that's come out um that like the stop woke act in florida um th- that was an act that we this was a, this was a, you know at, uh, people like chris rufo were supportive of it and the idea was that they were going to simply ban um d- 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 certain topics in in american higher education uh, and when they were t- testifying about this in court they were even saying kind of like well this would mean that you couldn't be anti you could be anti-affirmative action but a professor couldn't be pro-affirmative action like okay you've just described something that is laughably unconstitutional and we warned about that being unconstitutional tried to get florida not to pass it they did pass it and then of course you know we sued uh and we won as we knew we would so i uh, i am very critical of of that attempt in particular because it's the one piece of legislation despite a lot of legislation I, I have my issues with the the only one that was absolutely clearly unconstitutional as a curricular ban in higher ed and and we have defeated the first version of it if it comes up again we'll we'll we'll, we'll defeat it again so we are critical you know of of attacks from the right however i do get a little frustrated though i remember saying like so one third of the professors getting punished uh they initially start from attempts from the right um, like Fox News or uh, some sometimes Turning Point USA, you know, targeting professors. Uh, so about one third of them. You can't entirely let the left off the hook for that too, though, because ultimately the ones do the firing are usually also, you know, they're giving in to off-campus pressures because they don't value free speech that much anymore. So, like, if everybody on the left was still really great on freedom of speech, none of this, none of this stuff would be, uh, would be possible. But I remember pointing this out: this one third. Uh, you know, but coming from the right and having someone go, well, I can do math. And that indicates that you're saying that the, this large number of people, you know, a lot of these threats come from the left. I'm like, oh, honey, like like if you're if you're asking me to say that more of this actually the, the overall, particularly on campus, more of this comes from the right than the left. That's asking me to lie. Right. And in fact, uh, there is a follow up question here by Ira Strauss. Um, that has to do with the free speech movement and um, as a reaction to uh, McCarthyism and Red Scare and so on and so forth. And uh, Ira makes the point that, uh, and asks, um, what do you think of the evidence that this is to some extent a single long problem rather than a reversal? That is the evidence that the McCarthy era actually mostly restored freedom of speech on campus about communism and the free speech movement 
was mostly about restoring cancel culture on campus by way of mainstreaming communism, again, along with its critical theory of short. I mean, the point here, I think, uh, is, Greg, that this is about human nature. This is about yeah. the essence of free speech. And of course, this is an ongoing battle uh, that 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 never ends, even though there might be, you know, highs and lows. But what what do you what what what's your what's your what's your response to this argument that is, in fact this is a single long problem? Yeah, well, I mean, like the, the problem of censorship, of course, is a single long problem, and that's why you know I call my Substack the eternally radical idea because in every generation, more you know people rise up to demand censorship, and, and the the people demanding censorship are usually the ones who win uh, historically. So I definitely think the problem of censorship is a long term one. And I am, you know, di different among a lot of ac uh, uh, friends uh, of academic freedom and freedom of speech that I am critical of some of the free speech movement of the 60s because they wanted free speech for them and not for you. Uh, and this happened that some of the people, even in the early movement, you know, they, they uh, what they were arguing for, uh, you know, was. Uh, we want to be able to talk about politics, but, you know, when the uh, speakers show up, you know, uh, uh, we'll unplug, you know, their instruments, we'll, we'll shout them down, all this kind of stuff. There was a lot of hypocrisy among people who claim to be pro-free speech. I also uh, think that uh, people do a bad job of teaching what the argument against the free speech movement primarily was. It wasn't censorship is good. It was this is supposed to be an apolitical space, um, that, that essentially this is not a place where we're just going to browbeat people into agreeing with our politics. So I think that some of the critiques of, of the early free speech movement uh, are unfortunately valid. That being said, you know, I'm also among people like Harvey Silverglate, Nadine Strawson, but some of the real old school Ira Glasser, old school free speech people who really meant it and they meant it for everybody. Like these were the kind of people who when, uh, you know, Shockley, um, uh, who was a, I believe he was a eugenicist, would show up on campus. They'd actually go to the speech and just ask hard questions. And I'm like, great. You know, like like that's actually the way we're supposed to be handling some of the stuff. So I definitely get some of the critique of the free speech movement and even share some of it to be given there was, there was some real hypocrisy in it. Um, but there also are people, you know, who are my, you know, heroes who actually really meant it. I only um, wanted to spend uh, before. Yeah. I think I think we should spend the last ten minutes or so on on addressing the question. You know, what's to be done? There, mm -hmm. there are several questions. Yeah, but please, before that, I go, uh, I think the question yeah. that you just handled was very, very important because I want to make a distinction. I came to the Netherlands in 1992. And I thought that the discussion on free or the subject of free speech in the West, in Western countries, was literally academic, literally. I don't know if you remember that, but it was something you read about. It was like the witch burnings. It was censorship used to happen in the West. It was terrible. Lots of people died. Lots of people suffered. But you know what? That's really behind us. It's these people who are coming from non-Western countries and in particular Muslim countries who have to be initiated into accepting the idea of free speech. That is how I got into the free speech movement. And I am, I don't know, Greg, about you, but I am actually really stunned and mugged by reality to find this whole cancel culture thing is just shocking because it's a way of the, the people in the West, the most civilized of civilizations saying, let's go back to primitive times. Let's go back to censorship and everything that censorship entails. The intolerances, the, you know, the tribalization of the human race. Um, so that is, I think, for me, the, if you look at, you know, the history of, uh, of free speech in the West is what does that mean? Is it does it mean we're going back? Like were we done? Have we hit a dead end? Uh, lots of questions in my head about what happened to hauling 1.5 billion Muslims into the era of accepting free speech. What about trying to persuade the Chinese to accept free speech or yep. the Russians? all of these other intolerant uh, civilizations and cultures and peoples. What happened to that? Why are we behaving like the people we're supposed to be enlightening? Yeah, and I think um, 
I, I think that is a good uh, segue into um, addressing the issue of what to do. Um, and I will say, I'm not that surprised as uh, you are, Ayan. I think I learned many years ago that um, that free speech in many ways is an unnatural thing. And that's also why uh, Greg labels it uh, the eternal radical idea, because it's it's about culture and education. It's not about nature. It's uh, and our nature is is quite the opposite in 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 many ways. But to start with, start with you, Greg. I mean, how do we uncancel the American sure. mind? So we we spend about a third of the book talking about potential solutions, and we're we're trying to like um it, we're trying to be very broad and start the discussion. We don't we don't claim to be able to fix it. But one thing that we do are really clear about is that we don't think particularly in higher ed that, that this is this is you know cutting around the edges is going to do it we, we we think you need big and bold solutions i think that um i think university of texas at austin is you know a great possibility but i also think there needs to be like a thousand more of them you know like i think there has to be ways that uh, I am sufficiently despondent about a lot of what's going on in elite higher ed at, at a particular. I want other ways that smart, hardworking autodidacts can actually show that um, without having to go to college at all, that they're extremely hard, hardworking, extremely smart. Um, and we talk about potential solutions that way. We also realize you have to get back to right to the very start. We have a whole chapter on parenting, you know, parenting. Uh, and the goal there is like, yes, I know you're terrified of your of your kid being canceled. I think you should be more concerned about your kid being a canceller. You should have kids who are willing to say, this is my friend and I stand by them, um, even if uh, when, when, when the mob comes for them. We talk about, you know, things as simple as cultivating curiosity um, and, uh, and, and and epistemic intellectual humility, um, which is the thing that I'm really trying to teach my kids at a young age is just, you know, th there's no smart person who thinks they know everything. Those, those two things are incompatible. Um, th and uh, so I try to instill that very early on. And I do think we need some substantial K through 12 reform. Um, and so it's not that I disagree with some of the uh, with some of the problems that some of these laws are trying to target. But my belief is that you need a positive vision of what K through 12 should look at, as opposed to just don't do the following 50 things. And so I wrote something because I'm stuck with the formula called empowering the American mind that gives principles like individualism, you know, you know, talks about cognitive distortions, all, all this kind of stuff that you want to have a positive vision of what K through 12 reform should look like. I even uh, confess that I've come fully around to the idea of vouchers. I, I think that we need a lot more, you know, experimentation in the way we do education. And we even have a chapter on what corporations can do to keep themselves out of the culture war. And one thing is, you know, it, it, if you if you have one of these students, you know, is coming to you who's, who, who signed one of these ideological letters? I don't. I still think it's cancel culture if you're saying I'm not. I'm not going to hire somebody for whatever their political point of view is. But it's entirely fair to to ask: Are you the kind of ideologue who will create a cancel mob to get rid of anyone who disagrees with your politics at this organization? Because honestly, we want people who can work with people even they disagree with. Because this is America, and also we don't want to cut, cut ourselves off to to talent. Uh, because you know, you think about some of the smartest people you've ever met and they are people who aren't, aren't necessarily uh you know filled with social graces all the time or, or, or and sometimes are quite in, eccentric people themselves I, I mean i always think of one last thing i always think about uh giving a DEI statement to Richard Feynman, you know, being like, you have to fill this out to get this job, um, you know, to be a physicist. And he would have told you to go to hell, even if he agreed with a lot of it. Ayan, what's your re recipe for um, on canceling the American mind? I think those of us who are pro free speech, uh, we really understand it. And uh, I have to humbly agree with you. Yes, it is not nature. We're not born with the desire for free speech. It is nurture. Um, and the answer lies there. And the answer is that we have to claw back our way into <clears throat> meaning making institutions, into education and information institutions, into the entertainment industry, all of these places, and I think we've ceded control. I think we've been on the defensive for far too long. And we, meaning those of us who love freedom of speech and who think that freedom of speech is the cornerstone of our civilization, I think we really have to get back into the ring and battle it out. Mm -hmm. 
Rick, we still have a, a few minutes. Um, you you begin the book with a story, the, the story from Hemline, uh, which in fact, this is about a, a teacher who showed uh, an image of the Prophet Muhammad and then she was uh, not rehired. But because of the uproar um, in the broader community, uh, the college in fact had to back down. And so my question is, um, has cancel culture topped? Has it culminated? Uh, is it getting worse or is it uh, getting better? Well, no, unfortunately, what actually happened at Hamlin is they fired that professor, even though she um, warned students that, you know, there might be something someone would find offensive. She did it multiple times. It was in the syllabus. Um, the backlash was enough that the president announced that she was stepping down. But more recently, Hamline has come come back and doubled down on, on, on them doing having done the right thing in that case. So that case doesn't have nearly as much of a happy ending as it was looking like it was going to, you know, even just a couple of weeks ago. I, I have been hearing oftentimes from the same people who tried to tell me cancel culture wasn't even real or was a hoax that cancel culture is now over. And I'm like, I just kind of roll my eyes at this one, too, because it's like, no, uh, in the past you know, uh, year or so, we've seen shout downs at Yale Law School. And that's a, it, 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 it's unusual to have at, at the top, you know, five law schools to actually have shout downs. We saw this at Stanford, my alma, uh, my alma mater at the law school there. Um, and we had it. Robbie George just got shouted down. Hardly a nicer, more thoughtful scholar out there than, than Robbie George to be shouted down. We've seen a real uptick in shout downs at, um, and in some cases at like San Francisco State University, the university really siding essentially with the shout downers, you know. Uh, so it's definitely not over. I think there is a little bit of we don't seem quite as crazed as we were in 2020, 2021. But my fear is that we're going to get we're going to go from like, a, say, a B plus in freedom of speech as a country. And we went down to an F, you know, sometime between 2020 and 2022. Um, and we're going to get up to a D minus and be like, Phew, thank goodness that's over. If you should uh, make one recommendation to our viewers, uh, you know, what can I do out there if I want to uh, fight this uh, cancer culture? Just one piece of good advice and not a long list. What would that be? Go to thefire.org. Um, check out our campus free speech rankings and don't send your kids to schools that are terrible for free speech. Mm -hmm. And Ayan? So this is a campus audience. So I would say, uh, when you find yourself in a situation, you think, should I say it or should I not? And could I be the only one really? Raise your hand and say what you think. Okay. Um, I want to thank the uh, the audience for many good questions. And I want to apologize that we didn't have the time to uh, address uh, all of them. Um, it is It is, in fact, we have had more questions today than in all the pre previous uh, webinars uh, combined. So that's a good thing. And I also want to thank uh, uh, Greg and uh, wish you uh, good luck with uh, the book. Let's hope it will, it will have a, a wide and attentive uh, audience. Uh, and thank you to uh, Ayan as well. And, and I just want to say that uh, this uh, webinar was brought to you uh, by the Ayan Hirsi Ali Foundation. And if you like what we are doing here, please consider going to the website, theahafoundation.org and make a donation. Uh, my name is Fleming Rose. Thank you for joining us uh, and have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And please, uh, go to the AHA Foundation, but also go to the FIRE Foundation. Uh, so. Absolutely.